Hello and welcome back to Tea Book Club. So this month um, we are reading the story of Japanese tea by Taya Sosin and at the end of the month we will meet up online to discuss the book and share our thoughts. Now if you caught my reading last week I did rather a long reading to introduce it just because this book is so exciting and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I've been reading a bit this week again still really enjoying the book um, and I think the next section that we'll read today will be quite interesting as well. So, if you're interested in Tea Book Club, um, head over to teabookclub.org or follow the link below and you can get a bit more information and also sign up. And that way you can join us at the end of the month for the chat. So, on to the reading. I'm on page 26 and the section is Organic Tea Farming. Organ organic tea farming, yuki saibai, in essence omits the use of any agrochemicals and most chemical fertilisers. Instead, substance, substances that are of a natural nature, for example, not chemically altered, are used. Examples of substances that are often employed by tea growers in Japan are animal or plant-based fertilisers, such as livestock excrements, fish meal, bone meal, oil caked from rapeseed, compost, straw and other natural materials such as fallen leaves and branches and pampas grass. Organic production in Japan is regulated under the Japanese Agricultural Standards JAS, guidelines for organic foods published by the Ministry of Agric Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. The certification and assessment of products is conducted by registered certifying bodies that conduct tests and take care of administration on behalf of the MAFF. The organic standards are defined based on the positive list system, which includes des descriptions of products that are allowed for use in the on the field. The main function of the standard system is to prohibit misleading labelling of products that are not organically produced at all. They set the standard for labelling procedures in order to protect manufacturers and safeguard the organic brand, but fail to define a standard for what organic produce should be, while the education towards the people on how non-organic products affect our health and environment remains largely neglected. The majority of consumers in Japan are convinced of the fact that everything that is produced on Japanese soil is good for their health. This blind trust in the country's policy and its manufacturers inevitably limits the possibility for a movement to promote organic products. The main appeal of organic products is that it is of a healthier and more environmentally friendly solution to the more perilous chemical applications that are commonly used. But when the consumer is already convinced by the seemingly safe nature of products and there is blind trust in supermarket shelves, then the need and opportunity for a market, that market for organic products becomes limited. In effect, producers too become reluctant to even consider be beginning manufacturing organic products. In addition, organic tea is being looked down upon by the tea industry. Contemporarily, green tea is assessed in terms of umami flavour. Only if the amount of umami is high and the sweetness is strong, then the quality of the product is considered positively. Bringing about a strong umami value in the tea largely depends on the amounts of added nutrition to the roots. It of course goes without saying that chemically altered products are much more effective in achieving this desired result. In the case of organic products, the capacity for flavour enhancement is comparatively limited, and as a result, organic teas are perceived lesser in quality by the contemporary tea industry. It is even so that organic teas are not even allowed a shot at the yearly tea auction, which is reserved for conventional producers and frequented by large-scale industrial wholesalers and tea vendors. When the consumers are not educated to understand the difference between conventional manufacturing and organic products, and the tea industry as a whole is not supportive of organic tea and dismisses it as inferior, then this truly makes it a scary and risky business for tea producers to go all in on organic tea production. Yet the preservation of our health and environment are not the only appeals of organic production. Tea in general can have a far greater appeal and capacity than the limited focus on umami flavour alone. When assessing organic tea, I feel that we need to change our perception and approach to the product. It must be seen in separation, e.g. as a different type of product from conventional mass-produced teas. A first step would be to stop comparing organic products to conventional products. An organic censure can impossibly can impossibly be compared to a conventionally produced censure, and it is even, the, even more absurd to look for similar flavour patterns in an organic product. It is impossible to achieve the same lushness of flavour with organic growth as is common for conventional products. It is even necessary to imitate a crop that, that is it even necessary to imitate a crop that in recent years has become possible to produce through artificial methods. 
considering that over 60 years ago the use of chemicals on the fields and mechanised equipment in factories wasn't as widely spread as it has, is today, and 100 years ago people wouldn't even have thought of the possi possibility for such approaches. What we call organic now, and promoters a fashionable brand, is what was universal in the past. This being said, it is my belief that it is organic tea that is representative of Japan's more than 800 years of tea growing tradition. In fact, what I believe is that organic tea shouldn't merely be organic by certification, but organic by being in harmony with nature, just the way it always has been. Natural tea farming. Natural tea farming, she's in Saibai, solely relies on the vitality of the plant's natural environment to provide the nourishment and protection for its growth. No agricultural products of any kind, not even organic products, are applied to the soil or roots of the bushes, which allows them to develop as they would have been growing as wild entities in the mountain, on the mountain flanks. This method is more extreme than the common organic practices, but brings about an absolutely natural vigour in the finished product, comp complemented by a taste and aroma that can only be obtained in that specific area where those bushes have been growing. The producer, in turn, has the responsibility for this cultivation method to work to maintain an environment that can allow the bushes to develop relying solely on their own vitality. <coughs> Specifically, this means that the producer perceives the qualities of the grounds on which the bushes grow. For example, in, sim in similarity to residential grounds or sports ground, farmland that has been levelled by heavy machinery is likewise only capable of housing weed weeds and grasses. On the contrary, mountains provide fertile grounds for the growth of trees and shrubs. This knowledge helps the manufacturers of natural tea to understand that their tea bushes will grow better in environments that are similar to the rich environments, environments an unoutfitted mountain flank provides. The simple reason for this is that, while in the natural world an abundance of different plants and living creatures ex exist in coexistence, the tea bushes too, instead of growing in an environment solely of their own, are likely to flourish better when growing in harmony the surrounding ecosystem, benefiting from the advantages of the food chain. However, natural tea farming is not a matter of entrusting everything directly and solely to nature itself. Should the tea bushes tea garden be left abandoned, it would, will quickly it will quickly overgrow into more forest land, near forest land, and therefore at least requires the care and maintenance of the farmer. This is the difference between wild growth and natural farming. When the farmer maintains a conscious care of his farm, then only can the tea garden develop its own natural rhythm. Through the modernisation of farming methods and the implementation of advanced machines, facilities, agricultural products, etc., people have become able to change and influence, dominate, the rhythm of the and growth of the tea bushes and agricultural produce in general. It can be said that the deviations that are inherited in such procedures it can be said that through the deviations that are inherent in such procedures, we have also become able to gain a clearer outlook on the true essence of tea and the values that are universal and unchanging throughout our existence. It is this essence to which manufacturers of a natural tea adhere. Natural tea farming is by no means a return to a nostalgic past. It is an approach that incorporates essential values that are based on our history and our contemporary condition and that provide us the tools to understand how to let tea be tea and to let people be people. It is only because natural methods were part of the lives of our predecessors since they lived in harmony with their natural environment more than we do now and that we tend, that we tend to see natural farming merely as a nostalgic escape. But in fact, it is, the, it is the belief of such contemporary manufacturers that to maintain sincere towards our natural environment is the only appropriate way to connect the present to a bright future for our grandchildren. So, I think that's quite a nice um, bit to read, and we've looked at two different farming methods there. If you haven't got the book already, I highly recommend getting it and jumping in and reading, because it's fascinating, and the way Tyus talks about tea and farming and production and Japanese tea as a whole is really brilliant. So, get the book and join us at the end of the month to discuss it and share your thoughts. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you.